Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? This ain't murder three. Strange things that I've been hearing, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Welcome to Strange Things, broadcasting from the Raimundo Rios Mayo Library in Arkansas. And welcome to tonight's show. I'm your host, Chris James. This will be Season 2, Episode Number 7. It is February 18th, 2017. Tonight we will be talking about strange sounds and strange noises that people have been reporting all over the place. Tonight's show was suggested by my wife, Lulu. She said I should do something on all these strange sounds people keep reporting. Before we get into all that weird noise, let's look into a lack of it, and more like a lack of sounds. The Mapimi Silent Zone, or La Zona del Silencio, is the popular name for a desert patch near the Balsón de Mapimi in Durango, Mexico, overlapping the Mapimi Biosphere Reservoir. It is known for radio signals disappearing. On occasion, electronics cease to work as well. In July 1970, an Athena test missile was launched from the U.S. military base near Green River, Utah. The missile was heading towards White Sands Missile Range, but they lost control of it in flight. The missile fell in the Mapimi Desert region. The rocket was not armed, but it was carrying two small containers of Cobalt-57, a radioactive element commonly associated with the construction of what are known as salted bombs. These bombs didn't blow things up, but... They rendered the place uninhabitable through radioactive fallout. The one that flew into Mexico was just a test missile. After several weeks, local farmers found the missile and they reported the crash to authorities. This is not the kind of thing you want laying in your field. The missile came down in northeast corner of the state of Durango. Once the rocket was found... A road had to be built in in order to get trucks and equipment to the crash site. The missile, along with a few truckloads of contaminated soil, was removed. Could the crash have been caused by the mysterious effects on electronics? The government never did figure out why they had lost control of the rocket. According to Dr. Santiago Garcia, There has been an anomaly in this area since sometime in the mid-19th century. Farmers have been reporting hot rocks that that fall from the sky. This sounds a bit like meteorites. Why would so many meteorites fall in this one area? This may be a side effect of whatever is causing the sound problems. Or... Could it be the sound problems are caused by the number of meteorites? In the 1930s, Francisco Sarabia, a pilot for the northern Mexican state of Coahuila, reported that his radio had mysteriously ceased to function as he was crossing the zone, earning him the distinction of being the Zone of Silence's first victim. Why would it take so long to discover this anomaly? Until this incident, no one was running around the zone with a radio. The farmers working in and around the area didn't have radios or TVs. Engineer Harry de la Peña was the first outsider to discover the zone and its perplexing radio interference properties. Humans have been residing in and around the scrub and cactus-filled desert area since prehistoric times when an unknown tribe of natives clustered around a water hole, which is still in existence today. The community of Saboyos, Durango, some 25 miles away, 
is the nearest settlement to the zone. This would be your starting point if you wanted to look into the area. From there, you'll be treated to an expanse of flat terrain, park marked with thorny desert bushes and infested with poisonous snakes. No different from any other desert in that respect. This place does make Laredo look like a garden spot. Peña and his group became aware of the silence when they found that their walkie-talkies didn't work. Looking into the communications problem, it was found that the radio signals were being transmitted as fast as they should have been, and kind of like dial-up in the Internet compared to Wi-Fi. The radio was sending out a signal, but the receiver was coming out as a mere whisper. Even with the volume turned up full, the sound just wasn't there. The scientists all thought this may be caused by some magnetic force in the area. Since the engineers initially visit, since the engineers initial visit, scientists from around the world have visited the zone, flocking to the research facility erected at its very heart by the Mexican government. The research lab is called the Biosphere. The zone's somewhat foreboding name has been changed to Mar de Tichus, or the Sea of Tithus, due to the fact that it was once underwater millions of years ago. Tethys was one of the titan offsprings of Gaia and Uranus, earth and sky. The Tethys Ocean was an ocean that existed between the continents of Gondwana and Laruasia La during much of the Mesozoic era, before the opening of the Indian and Atlantic Ocean during the Cretaceous period. It is also referred to as the Tethys Sea or Neotethys. And curiously enough, the zone lies just north of the Tropic of Cancer and south of the 30th parallel, which places it in the company of a number of other planetary anomalies, such as the Bermuda Triangle and the Dragon's Triangle, which is the Japanese version of the Bermuda Triangle. UFOs and the presence of non-human life have been recorded in this zone of silence. Until a few years ago, there were people living in the zone who could remember having had encounters with extraterrestrial creatures in the early decades of this century. On October 13, 1975, Ernesto and Josefina Diaz, an enterprising couple, drove into the zone looking to collect fossils and rocks. They were driving a brand new Ford pickup, which shouldn't have given them any problems. As they are out collecting their prizes, they noticed a desert rainstorm was heading their way. Rainstorms in the desert can be deadly. The water doesn't sink into the soil, but it flows over it, causing flash floods. You stand a better chance of drowning in the desert than of dying of thirst. Hoping to avoid being caught in a flash flood, they wisely packed their vehicle up and sped away. The rain caught up with them, and soon the ground turned to mud. The new pickup lost traction, and the couple became stranded, stuck in a mud hole. As they struggled to get their vehicle moving in the mud, two figures appeared in the deluge, and they looked to be approaching. Two extremely tall men, dressed in what looked like yellow raincoats and caps, and they're walking their way. The two didn't look strange, if not for the fact that they came from nowhere, and I just happened to be walking by the couple when they needed help the most. The men instructed the cold and wet couple to get inside the pickup again, while the men pushed. Soon, the vehicle found purchase on the wet ground, and it was freed from its trap. They were able to drive to firmer ground. 
The couple were overjoyed at being rescued, so the husband got out of the pickup to thank the two men. The two men had vanished. They disappeared just as they had appeared. There were no footprints in the mud and no rocks nearby that they might have stepped on. The rain was letting up, giving the couple a clear view of the surrounding fields. No one was around. We're going to take a pause here, play a couple of commercials, so don't go away. We will be right back after this. You're listening to Arkanasa Radio. Do you have skin? Would you like to take better care of it? Call Lourdes James, independent beauty consultant, and set up an appointment. Call 723-3019. If your vision isn't what it used to be, and you're not sure you're seeing Bigfoot or just your neighbor mowing his lawn, stop on by Del Norte Optical, 107 Calle Del Norte just across the street from the Embassy Suites. You should be able to see what you're looking at. Looking for a great cup of coffee? Swing on by the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 1002 Eaterby Day, Suite Number 7. Not a coffee drinker? They have hot chocolate, hot tea, and sometimes muffins and cookies. It's a great place to meet your friends for a conversation or curl up in the corner with a good book. The Organic Man Coffee Trike. Life is too short to drink bad coffee. Though we gotta say goodbye. No, don't say goodbye. Stay with us. This is Arcanelza Radio. Quédate con nosotros, estás escuchando Arcanaza Radio. You're listening to Strange Things with Chris James. And welcome back. Now we're talking about the zone of silence. The travelers crossing the zone regularly report seeing strange lights or fireballs maneuvering at night and changing colors and sometimes hanging motionless and then taking off at great speed. Two ranchers heading back from town witnessed a sparkling light floating down from the dark sky. The light appeared to land and what appeared to be humanoid beings came from inside the light. The creatures looked as if they were glowing with the same eerie light. The two men watched as these creatures began walking in their direction. Well, they decided it was best to get going and not get involved with these weird things. The physical traces of these nocturnal visits can be found. One witness returned one morning to the site where he had seen the mysterious lights flying about the previous night, and he found that the scrub vegetation had been set on fire. Now the brush in the area is far enough apart to prevent fire running from place to place. Something had to burn each bush involved. And dozens of similar reports emerged from the zone, told by reliable witnesses. Dr. Santiago Garcia, who has devoted much of his life to investigation of this anomalous region, has speculated that some of the lights seen by the residents could well be from drones left behind by the U.S. military. He speculated these flying vehicles might recharge their solar cells by day and then conduct covert missions under cover of darkness. Garcia points out that when the Air Force came to collect the Athena missile wreckage, they took a long several truckloads of desert sand for analysis. 
There's a widespread belief that the huge deposits of magnetite exist in the area and that this iron ore is responsible for the dampening of the electromagnetic waves. It has also been proven that considerable deposits of uranium exist in the mountain range, fencing the zone of silence. 1976, a visitor to the region took a photograph of a UFO, landed near a topographic feature known to the locals as Magnet Hill. The photo clearly show a shiny silver object resembling a large stew pot or metal disc. The photographer managed to get more shots of the craft as it took off. He said it rose up into the sky with a roar and then it disappeared to the west. Yet not all the, ex the extraterrestrial visitors have been as elusive. The staff of a small ranch tell of the time they were visited by three tall, blonde visitors, two male and one female, all having long, flowing hair. They were polite to a fault, extremely handsome, and dressed in a funny manner. Their Spanish was flawless, and it had kind of a musical, lilting ring to it. The reason for these visits was to obtain water from the ranch's well. The unusual visitors would ask their host to please fill their canteens with water, but they never requested food or anything else. When asked where they had come from, the visitors would limit themselves to smiling and saying, from above. These visitors sound a lot like what is known as the Nordic type of alien, referred to by ufologists. The Spanish researcher Antonio Ribera described similar blondes operating in the vicinity of Rosalon in the Pyrenees in the southern part of France, right on the Spanish border. These blondes would only trouble their human hosts for bread and milk, paying for them with gold nuggets. White-haired Nordics were reported along the Sierra Nevada in California, where they would come down to barter with townspeople on occasion. There's some kind of a connection of sorts between certain enigmatic deserts and these angel-like creatures. No experience in the zone of silence is easily forgotten. And journalist Luis Ramirez Reyes will almost certainly never forget his own. During November 1978, Ramirez visited the zone as part of a news team assigned to cover a story on the bizarre site. Choosing to go ahead of the main team, Ramirez and his photographer drove into the desert, navigating more by guesswork than by knowledge of where their final destination was located. They were en route to the government biosphere, there to do research into the zone. But how could they go wrong? There was only the one road. Things got interesting when they came to a Y in the road, and they took the wrong turn. They soon found they were lost in the desert with no food or water. After driving too long, they discovered they were not getting any closer to the biosphere. Ramirez spotted three men walking along the side of the road, and he told the driver to stop and ask directions. The driver sped by the three without even slowing down. This got Ramirez to worrying that the driver was suffering from the heat and maybe a lack of water. Then Ramirez spotted the three men walking up ahead once more. Now how could they have gotten ahead of a speeding car, and on foot no less? He told the photographer to stop, even if he didn't see the three men. The driver slowed to a stop, thinking that perhaps Ramirez was losing his mind. The three men looked like local farmers. They were dressed appropriately, but none of them was carrying any water or other provisions. 
The three men claimed to be looking for some stray animals that had wandered from their farm. Ramirez asked about the biosphere. And the three men said they should drive cross-country out through the brush and the cactus, and they would soon come to the sphere. Ramirez told the driver to follow the directions, and the three men who, as far as the driver was concerned, they didn't exist. With no other option, they took off out into the middle of nowhere. The ground was relatively flat, and the brush was thin enough to maneuver through. After driving cross-country for a long time, both men were relieved to find the biosphere rising in the distance. Once they arrived and met up with their team, they discussed their unusual encounter in the desert. Harry de la Pena, the head of the sphere, listened to their account. Then, in a sobering tone, Pena told them that the only people in the desert were part of the biosphere team, and there were no flocks for peasants to look for. An aerial survey in later days convinced the reporter of the utter desolation of the region that stretched for hundreds of miles. But if there are no people, ranches, or settlements in the area, who were those three men, and how did they get from one spot to another in such a short time? Where did they come from, and where did they go? The tall, blonde Nordic visitors, or other normal-looking humanoids, are they're not the only kind reported in the zone. There have been sightings of oddly clad beings, only a few tall as well. Ruben Lopez was driving through the zone one night on his way to visit a relative in Ceballos. The engine of his van began to sputter. This is not what you want to hear driving through the desert, or any time for that matter. Lopez had just worked on his vehicle, and it should be in good shape. He soldiered on, hoping for the best. As he drove, he spotted what looked to be five small figures standing on the side of the road ahead. They looked like little kids until he noticed they were all dressed in silver one-piece suits. Each of them was wearing what looked like a football helmet, or close to it. As he pulled alongside these silver-clad creatures, he could see their faces. They had adult features. His van chose that moment to come to a stop. The creatures all came over to, to the stalled van, and they began to look at Lopez. Uh, Lopez got very nervous by these things, looking like something out of a science fiction movie. He raced the engine, trying to coast it in, coax it into life. The sound of the engine startled the creatures, who all turned and ran off into the desert. As soon as they were out of sight, the van began to run smoothly, and Lopez was able to continue on his trip. Now, there are also some ancient ruins in the Zone of Silence, which bring about another disquieting enigma. Archaeologists have been able to figure out just how old these ruins are. They undoubtedly form an astronomical observatory thousands of years old. At some point in time, people came to the middle of the desert, and they built an enormous city. There was a watering hole nearby, but the soil wouldn't grow any kind of food. Any food would have to be hauled in from the folks to survive. The primitive tribes living nearby are not connected with these ruins, no one can say who they were built by or what became of the builders. The site is referred to as the Mexican Stonehenge. At some point in antiquity, someone was quite active in the zone. Perhaps someone was interested, as our modern astronomers and geologists, in the large number of small meteorites that are attracted by the zone's magnetic pull. A meteorite that crashed in Chihuahua in the late 1950s contained crystalline structures that are far outdated the solar system itself. Researcher Luis Maeda Villalobos concluded that the meteorite contains material as old as the universe. 
Our solar system is some six billion years old, while the meteorite's age had been estimated at 13 billion years. Whether we are dealing with UFOs, dimensional visitors who find the magnetic aberration facilitate their journeys, or merely a poor understanding of part of our world with unsuspected properties, no easy answers apply to the riddle posed by the zone of silence. The builders of the mysterious ruined observatory would have probably agreed. And we're going to take a break here and play a couple of commercials, and then we will be right back, so don't go away. You're listening to Arkanasa Radio. Do you have skin? Would you like to take better care of it? Call Lourdes James, independent beauty consultant, and set up an appointment. Call 723-3019. If your vision isn't what it used to be, and you're not sure you're seeing Bigfoot or just your neighbor mowing his lawn, stop on by Del Norte Optical, 107 Calle Del Norte, just across the street from the Embassy Suites. You should be able to see what you're looking at. Looking for a great cup of coffee? Swing on by the Organic Man Coffee Trek, 1002 Eaterby Day, Suite Number 7. Not a coffee drinker? They have hot chocolate, hot tea, and sometimes muffins and cookies. It's a great place to meet your friends for a conversation or curl up in the corner with a good book. The Organic Man Coffee Trek. Life is too short to drink bad coffee. No, don't say goodbye. Stay with us. This is Arcanaza Radio. Quédate con nosotros. Estás escuchando Arcanaza Radio. You're listening to Strange Things with Chris James. And welcome back. If you find this show is to your taste and you'd like to hear more of it, you can visit our archives at strangethings.podomatic.com. You'll find all of the archives there as well as a few of my books that I've written and read for the hopeful enjoyment of the crowd. Now, for as long as people have been recording things, There have been weird noises heard from all over the world. Some folks hear what sounds like trumpeting sound. This leads them to think it's the end of the world. The sound was was equated with angels blowing their horns to announce the end of times. Others hear a booming sound like distant cannon fire. Then there's that weird humming sound. December 11th, 2015, I was sitting at home watching TV. It was about 8.30 at night. I heard what I thought was thunder rumbling outside and to the west of town. Rain in Laredo is something to treasure, so I stepped outside to see what I might be missing. The sky was clear, and I could see stars. There were no clouds and no reason to be hearing thunder. I was about to go back in to finish watching the show when I heard what sounded more like cannon fire to the west. I went through basic and advanced training at Fort Knox and used to listen to the sound of 105 millimeter tank guns and 150 millimeter cannon firing at the live fire ranges on dozens of nights, so I know what it sounds like. As I stood there wondering what was making the sound, Maybe no Wave Laredo was having a real gun battle. It moved from my west 
to my southwest. And now the sound was over the downtown area of Laredo. I stood there transfixed by this mystery. The sound moved to my south, and then it started moving once more until it was to the east. The whole time frame was about five to ten minutes. Once the sound was out over Lake Casablanca, it just kind of stayed there in one place for a few minutes. And then it faded away to nothing. I asked a few of my neighbors if they had heard anything. My friend Eddie, Eddie with a Y, not I, said he had heard the booming sound on several occasions. Others said that they hadn't really noticed. I've seen lots of reports of similar sounds in other places. The physical therapist at my chiropractor's office had told me that her mother had heard something like it while driving home from Nuevo Laredo about two years previous. Residents of Florida have been hearing these sounds since the 50s. Some reports may have been connected to the Alcala bombing range, but the reports were far too numerous and spread out over an area that couldn't possibly be caused by military ordnance. Not even our government has that much ammo. The seismographs at the University of Florida showed no seismic record to coincide with the reported sounds. This would rule out any connection with high explosives being the cause. The folks hearing these booming sounds have come to live with it. Strange booming sounds have been mentioned as far back as the 1800s in India and Bangladesh. There's something called the Barisal Guns which have been heard for centuries. At first, the people living in Bangladesh along the Ganges River have reported hearing what sounded like cannon fire. They referred to it as the Barisal guns, thinking that ghosts or spirits were firing huge cannon somewhere in the distance. If there were folks firing big guns in the region for this long, they should have run out of gunpowder by now. We're talking a sound that comes and goes for centuries, but it's always off in the distance. Scientists try to explain this as being something called a skyquake. You know, like an earthquake, only in the sky. This explanation sounds a whole lot like they don't know, but they won't admit it. When Britain moved in and forced all the other Europeans out of India and Bangladesh, the British soldiers had to come to terms with these weird sounds. Any cannon fire heard on the horizon would draw an investigation. The troops would want to know who has these cannon. Patrols were sent out to find the culprits, but try as they might, the source of the sound was never tracked down. The soldiers would report back to their officers that the source of the gunfire just couldn't be found. The sound wasn't just heard in Bangladesh, but in India as well. An abstract sent into the magazine Nature in January 16, 1896, regards these sounds. H. H. Goodwin Austin said, The Barisal guns and similar sounds with reference to the letter that have been appearing in Nature on the above subject, I have read with interest that by Mr. G. B. Scott of the Indian Survey in your last issue. The question, I think, arises. Are we not dealing, in India at least, with two very different phenomena? Are these sounds like that of heavy ordnance, which are heard occasionally, at the base of the eastern Himalayas and the Garo and Kaisi hill range, the same as those longer known and more familiar as the Barisal guns. Mr. Scott's description of the sounds he heard when on board the steamer moored in the narrow channel near the sea are remarkably like wave action. He says sometimes a single report at other times two, three, or more in succession, never near, always in a distance, but not equally distant. 
Sometimes the report would resemble cannon from two rather widely separated opposing forces, at others from different directions, but apparently always from the southward, that is, seaward. This is precisely what one would hear on a still night when an ocean swell was coming up the Bay of Bengal and breaking all along a low shore with an undulating outline stretching many miles east and west. I have been twice around Barisal in a river steamer and once by native boat, which took many days, but I was not fortunate enough to hear the sounds. The report sent to the magazine Science has no answer as to what might be causing these weird sounds. I can only say I've heard them, but I have no explanation. This was written back in 1896. Now this does sound fascinating. It's one thing to hear a weird sound from one area, but for it to be heard in different locations and at the same time, now this is an oddity. I have found no more mention of the Barisal guns other than a rock group who have taken the name. The Soviet submarines have been reporting something they call quackers. These sounds were heard while the submarine was underway. The sonar operators would pick up sounds from around the sub that they were never able to explain. Most of these weird sounds were heard in the North Atlantic or the Arctic Oceans. The sonar operator said they sounded like the noises frogs made. As more and more reports came back from the Navy, the folks in Moscow became worried this might be some new secret device being used by NATO to track their ships. When no explanation was found, this only made them more worried. These are an example of unidentified submerged objects. These sounds appeared when submarines passed certain zones in the sea and behaved as if they were emitted by some moving underwater object. Nothing would register on sonar, but the sound was very much there, coming from something. When the sub left their patrol zone, the objects disappeared after emitting one final quack. These objects exhibited behavior like some living being, or maybe a, a manned vessel, showing obvious interest in the passing submarine, a circling around it, and trying to actively avoid sonar pulses, and so on. The speed of some of these objects were estimated using Doppler shift of their sound frequency. The speed was about 120 to 140 miles an hour. At that time, there wasn't any kind of vessel in either the Soviet or the United States arsenal that could move that fast underwater. Contact was attempted on several occasions, but apart from some obvious reaction to these attempts, such as changing the pitch of the sound or movement of the apparent sound source, nothing came of it. What with the Cold War making for lots of secrets, we have no idea how many of these quackers were reported or whether the U.S. Navy had any of these experiences. It kind of reminds me of the Foo Fighters reported during World War II. The main difference being, Foo Fighters were visual and quackers were audio. The Bloop. Now what on earth is the Bloop? 1997 Deep sea microphones captured a loud and unusual sound, which was dubbed the bloop, somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. These bloops are some of the loudest sounds of any type ever recorded in the Earth's oceans. Scientists have no idea what is causing this sound. They think it's coming from west of the coast of South America. It could be heard over 3,000 miles away from its source. The bloop sounds as if they're coming from some living creature and not a man-made object. There is no known creature in the ocean 
that can be the originator of these sounds. Every living thing in the ocean, and lots of not living things, have been catalogued by either scientists or Navy personnel. The bloop doesn't fit into any of these files. The scientists have listened to the recordings, and they can't even come up with a genus, let alone a species, to account for these sounds. Since 1997, the bloop hasn't returned. No one knows where it went, let alone what made them. Now, the Taos hum is a faint, low-frequency humming noise heard in and around the town of Taos, New Mexico. Not only is this humming sound a mystery, but it has some peculiar qualities as well. Only about 2% of Taos residents, about 1,400 people, can hear it. The low-pitched hum is between 30 to 80 hertz on the frequency scale. It has been described as sounding a bit like a diesel engine that is idling in the distance. Some folks say it's louder indoors than out. Some of the people bothered by the sound have tried earplugs and other acoustic quieting devices in an attempt to block out the sound. Nothing seems to help. Investigations by scientists, including some from the prestigious Sandia National Laboratories, have failed to find a source or even a plausible explanation for this phenomenon. One theory is that the sound is being caused by the U.S. Navy's ELF, or Extra Low Frequency, communication system that is used to communicate with the submarine fleet. The Navy claims no responsibility for the hum and simply ignore the requests for an investigation on their part. Not long ago, I read a book about secret underground bases in the United States. There was a photograph showing five Air Force personnel standing in front of a boring machine, like the one used to build the tunnel under the English Channel, only a bit smaller. Oddly enough, the photo was taken out in the desert. The article was telling how the Air Force was in the process of building underground facilities. This could explain some of the sounds, but not for the past 60 years. How many tunnels would there need to be for 60 years' worth of hum? And then there's the borehole to hell. The legend says that a group of Russian engineers, led by a man named Azakov, were drilling in Siberia. They had reached nearly nine miles deep when they broke through to a cavern. Intrigued by this unexpected discovery, they lowered electronic monitoring equipment down in an attempt to study the cavern. One of the instruments was a microphone. The thermometer registered about 2,000 degrees. Perhaps this is a lava flow. That would explain the heat, but what they heard coming from the microphone is unexplainable. It sounded like people being tortured in hell. It took me a while to find a good copy of the audio recording, but here it is. This is just a little bit disturbing, so if you're squeamish, you might want to turn your radio down for a minute or two. Dr. Azikov said, The information we are gathering is so surprising that we are sincerely afraid of what we might find down there. 
Dr. Azakov was the manager of the project in remote Siberia. The engineers all thought they had drilled into hell, and they just might release something, something nasty and wicked. One of the engineers said, This last discovery was nevertheless the most shocking to our ears, so much so that the scientists are afraid to continue the project. We tried to listen to the Earth's movement at certain intervals with super-sensitive microphones, which were let down through the hole. What we heard turned those logically-thinking scientists into a trembling ruin, explained Dr. Azakov. It was a sometime, it was a sometimes a weak but high-pitched sound, which we thought to be coming from our own equipment. But after some adjustment, we comprehended that Indeed, the sound came from the Earth's interior. We could hardly believe our own ears. We heard a human voice, screaming in pain. Even though one voice was discernible, we could hear thousands, perhaps millions in the background, of suffering souls screaming. After this ghastly discovery, about half the scientists quit out of fear. Hopefully, that which is down there We'll stay there, Dr. Azakov added. Late that night, a jet of luminous gas came spraying up from the borehole. It lit up the sky around the drill site, causing some of the workers to flee in horror. If you look this incident up, you'll find numerous sites proclaiming to be the best one out there. You'll also see lots of people saying that they know for a fact that this was all just made up. Who do you believe? I can understand why someone who didn't believe they would ever have to answer for their past transgressions would want to believe this is just a hoax. But I'll leave it up to you all to decide. We're going to take a break here, play a couple of commercials, and we will be right back. So don't go away. You are listening to Arkanasa Radio. Do you have skin? Would you like to take better care of it? Call Lourdes James, independent beauty consultant, and set up an appointment. Call 723-3019. If your vision isn't what it used to be, and you're not sure you're seeing Bigfoot or just your neighbor mowing his lawn, stop on by Del Norte Optical, 107 Calle Del Norte, just across the street from the Embassy Suites. You should be able to see what you're looking at. Looking for a great cup of coffee? Swing on by the Organic Man Coffee Trek, 1002 Eaterby Day, Suite Number 7. Not a coffee drinker? They have hot chocolate, hot tea, and sometimes muffins and cookies. It's a great place to meet your friends for a conversation or curl up in the corner with a good book. The Organic Man Coffee Trek. Life is too short to drink bad coffee. No, don't say goodbye. Stay with us. This is Arcanaza Radio. Quédate con nosotros. Estás escuchando Arcanaza Radio. You're listening to Strange Things with Chris James. And welcome back to the show. We are discussing some of these weird noises that people keep hearing. Then there's that weird trumpeting sound. Some folks think this is the end of the world. It's coming in from all over the planet, and it sounds like trumpets. In a town named Terrace, British Columbia, Canada, trumpeting sounds could be heard up in the sky. I have a clip 
of the sounds in order to hear the volume has to be turned up full. You'll hear a lot of background noise, but you can still hear the trumpeting sound. It sounds about as strange as it can get. Of course, the science guys claim this is just ice crystals rubbing together, or maybe it's pigeons calling each other. Then, in Allen, Texas, people talk about the trumpeting sound as well. It's odd that people living so far apart would be hearing the same sounds. There should be an explanation. But all the things the so-called scientists are coming out with sound as strange as the noises they're trying to do away with. Now for some strange sounds can only be heard using the radio. During World War II, the Germans had come up with a way to communicate from anywhere in the world, and the Allies were unable to decipher their messages. The secret was the Enigma machine. This device looked kind of like an overblown typewriter. It had three wheels that each time you typed a letter, the wheel would turn, causing the message to be hopelessly scrambled. Let's say you're the captain of a U-boat, and you're running low on fuel. You have your radio man contact Berlin using Morse code, and you ask for a refueling meet. Berlin sends out a message over open channels to an auxiliary cruiser to meet up with you and fill your tanks. The location of the rendezvous would be given to both you and the captain of the cruiser. Thus, you'd be able to continue your mission and sink Allied ships. All the Allies would hear is a bunch of gibberish, numbers that meant nothing to them. It wasn't until the British captured an Enigma machine along with its code books that the Allies were able to intercept the transmissions and thus beat the Nazis. A little-known incident took place off the coast of the United States. June 4, 1944, an aircraft carrier escort made sonar contact with a German U-boat, the U-505. The escorts immediately moved towards the contact, while the aircraft carrier, Guadalcanal, moved away at top speed, and they launched Grumman Hellcat fighters and a Grumman Avenger bomber. The fighters and bomber began searching for the sub and soon spotted it. After a brief battle, the sub surfaced to allow the crew to evacuate, and then the captain, Lieutenant Harold Long, attempted to scuttle the sub. Wait, captain or lieutenant? See, Harold Long was a lieutenant in rank, but he was the captain of the sub. So he was captain-lieutenant. The boarding party from the Guadalcanal managed to close the sea valves, and they saved the sub, along with its Enigma machine 
and code books. Sounds like someone is going to receive a promotion, right? Wrong. The captain of the Guadalcanal was nearly court-martialed for disobeying orders. He had been told to sink the sub, not capture it. See, the British already had the Enigma machine, but the Germans had no idea that the machine had been captured. Now, with the Guadalcanal capturing a second Enigma machine, it was feared the Germans would get word one of their code machines was now in Allied hands and simply change all their code books. This would have made the British Enigma machine useless. The government managed to keep the incident a secret, and the captain of the Guadalcanal didn't get in too much hot water. The U-505 was hidden for a while, until it finally was sent to the Chicago Field Museum. I've been on board, it was a long time ago, but it is well worth going and seeing. Now people learn from their mistakes. The next generation in secret communications came out during the Cold War. Now these strange sounds are only available to those who have shortwave radios. If you tune your radio to certain frequencies, you'll find these weird signals going out into the atmosphere. I know we're free to do with about anything we wish with our time and money, but who would set up a radio station to broadcast these sounds? Some unknown person, or people, have a transmitter that sends out this sound on a regular basis. You can tune in and listen day or night, but you won't understand it if you don't have the answer key. The numbers would be deciphered using one of two key sheets. As soon as the coded message was sent, both key sheets would be burned, removing any evidence of the coded message. And sometime after World War II, as the Cold War was getting cranked up, the Soviets and the Communists began sending out these transmissions. Some were just noise, while others had numbers intermixed with the signal. That's why they're called number stations. The signal's originator could be traced back to its origin, but the recipient was never found. Somewhere in the world was some secret agent listening to these signals and receiving his or her orders. And sometimes they were in Russian, and other times they were in German. With short wave, there's no way to limit the recipients. But it wouldn't matter as long as no one listening in had the code's decipher key. And how would you go about deciphering something that sounds like this?
To someone, this makes sense. But to the rest of us, it's just noise. Now, why not just send out the message over the Internet? Any message sent or received by computer runs the risk that it can still be found no matter how well you try to scrub the memory. The air around us is filled with these radio signals that are only for the select few. And Clyde Lewis from Ground Zero Media has had several shows about these number stations. Just search for groundzeromedia.org commune numbers. They're well worth listening to, and his show is far more creepier than mine. That's groundzeromedia.org commune numbers. Next, there are those voices that you sometime hear. Are they really inside your head? I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. If you'd like to listen to the archives, check out the website strangethings.potomatic.com. And if you'd like to contact us, go to strangethingsatarkanasa.com. We'll be back next Saturday with more Strange Things. Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? This ain't murder three. Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree.